good all the time. And it's awesome to have an opportunity to stir up the soil of the heart in preparation for the seed, the Word of God. And I pray that this morning you come in anticipation to hear from the Lord through His Word. And uh, I just pray that um, you'd be open and receptive as we'll continue our journey in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So if you would please open, open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians and we'll go through verses 17 all the way through 34. Again, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The title of the message is Celebration at the Table. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, things don't happen by coincidence. Everything's ordained. You know, the Lord putting that message on uh, Elizabeth's heart to share with us in regards to our calling here in this community and just being a light. And, you know, in, in conjunction with yesterday's outreach and just the outpouring of God's Spirit, you know, on His people and those that came. And it's tangible, right? It's palpable, you, you cannot deny the presence of God when God's people are gathered together to glorify His name. And it just um, really struck me the most as, as far as what Delibus was sharing um, in regards to just knowing that we know and leaving the rest to God. Knowing that we know that this is where God's called us to be, to bless this community that is because we're here that they're already blessed, you know? Because not that we're anything special, but we are in God's eyes, right? And it's the overflow. But I, I think one of the images that will stick with me for some time, because look, when you think about it like this, you know, in these terms, you know, um, even if it's just, and I know it's cliche to say, even if it's just one, but that's God's heart. That is truly the heart of Jesus, that He'll leave the 90, 99 to chase just one. So what's that tell us? That that should be our heart as well. Even if it's just one, and the one that sticks out the most in my mind uh, regarding yesterday's outreach was the little girl across the street, Danielle. And, and, and watching her, when she came out of the house with her, with her dad, she was across the street, and I caught her before she could cross, and I was just watching her. She was like literally just so lit up with enthusiasm about coming. And then finally crossed the street, came to, the, to our side of the street, and then was literally skipping as she came and tugging her dad like, hurry up, hurry up, you know? And, and just being here, her parents were sharing with me. I spoke with her mom, and the mom was sharing that she was so overwhelmed with joy about being here and did not want to go home because she was just having such a blessed time. But what blessed me the most was that her mom shared that listening to the worship yesterday, you know, being led by Daniel and the guitar and Elizabeth uh, singing, that uh, Danielle was just just blessed by the worship, you know, that she told her mom, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's so beautiful. She told her mom, it's so beautiful. And so we just don't know. And that's the way our God rolls, Right. And so it's tied in really to today's message because that's how God is in regards to celebration at the table because Paul's going to touch upon the, the importance of communion and, and how really, you know, and I, and I hate using these types of terms, but really how communion should be done, you know? I don't want to get into church anity as far as like we do this, this is how that's done, this is how it's not done and so on and so forth because... You know, the Spirit has the freedom to move within the churches as the, as the Spirit sees fit. And, and not, not everything that's done here is going to be duplicated in another church because, you know, God reaches people in the manner and meets them where they're at. And I'm talking about, you know, as we're going through Corinthians from a cultural standpoint and things of that nature, right? And so, this, but when you're talking about communion, there are certain things or elements involved in communion that that you can't miss and that cannot be omitted, so to speak, in the spirit of communion. And as we read through these verses, we're going to find that 
the church in Corinth, even even in communion, they were kind of even messing that up. <laughs> and and Paul had to had to correct them. He had to he had to bring it to their attention in regards to how wrong their hearts were when it came time to communion. Because as we're going to see, it is, it's a time of celebration. It's a celebration at the table. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I love celebrations. I mean, who doesn't like love a celebration? And, and really, we could use a lot more celebrating in our life rather than, you know, the naysaying and pointing out what's wrong or the shortcomings and so on and so forth. But if we really celebrate it, what's right there's a lot more than really what's wrong. Seriously, there really is. And and it, but the 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 time of communion is a celebration at the table. And so I want to jump in quickly because there's there's a lot to cover here. And and we look at verse 17 because Paul is now jumping to the next topic. You know, we he addressed the the whole covering of the head for the women and so on and so forth. And then he says here in verse 17, says, but in giving this instruction, so again, this is a time to take note. This is where the ears perk up and say, hey, we need to learn something. Paul's trying to teach us something. But in giving this instruction, instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse, for the worse. So Paul is is basically giving a, a word of uh, correction here, and he points out to them that hey, look, this behavior is unacceptable. He uses the term "come together" because it's important for us to note as a church that coming together as a church should be for the purpose of lifting each other up. For the purpose of lifting each other up. Not kicking each other when we're already down. Which kind of is... It, it happens. You know? It happens. We go into this uh, friends friends of Job mode. <laughs> right? I, I like, and I catch myself at times. You know, I want to I be Job. But I find myself more often than not being the friend of Job, if you know what I mean. Uh, you know, someone's got this going on in their life or that going on, and, and, and I'm, I'm the dude kicking the person that's down already instead of lifting them up, saying, well, you know what, you sh- maybe you shouldn't have done this, maybe you shouldn't have done that, or, you know, weren't you warned? And all that. And it's like that, and that's the old boom, kicking, kicking them when they're down. It's like, look, I'm already down, especially when someone's coming to you, when someone's coming to you and saying, hey, I, I need lifting up. Look, I recognize my shortcomings. I recognize that I messed up. But I don't need you kicking me while I'm down already. And so, like I said, I, I, I have a tendency, though, to be a friend of Job rather than, than Job himself, right? And, and so, but in the church, the church, the purpose of coming together as saints under the banner of, of Jehovah Nishi is, is to lift each other up. You know, uh, Hebrews tells us that. In Hebrews chapter 10, and you can read that in your own time, but basically Hebrews chapter 10 says, like, look, exhortation is, is key within the church. Do not forsake what the gathering as some do. Don't, don't, don't skip out on church because like, oh man, as some say, it's like, you know, it, you could have church wherever you're at. It's not that important. God is everywhere and making those excuses, so on and so forth. And look, that's not biblical. The Bible clearly teaches that we are to gather we are to congregate, congregate as, as believers. And so, but Paul is, is disappointed. This is a disappointment. It's like, hey, man, instead of coming together better for the better, you make things worse. You make them worse. And look at, look at how they're making matters worse. In verse 18, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you in order that those who are approved may have become evident among you. 
So what's the issue here in coming together? And he's referring to, again, in, in the form of having communion. Well, it's divisions. This is a common theme within the church of Corinth, division. You know, division, sadly, had crept into the time of communion. Which, to me, communion is like one of the most sacred times of, of fellowship. Which, let me, let me clarify, fellowship isn't just hanging out together. Like some people say, hey, it's, hey man, let's get together and fellowship. And, and, and what they're really referring to or meaning is, hey, let's go hang out. That's not fellowship. Fellowship is for the purpose of talking about the things of God and for the edification of the saints. So literally, if I say we're going to fellowship, you could bet that we're going to be talking about God and about the things of God and how uh, what the Lord is doing in your life and, and, and vice versa. I'm not going to be saying, hey, 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 bro, let's go fellowship. And uh, yeah, we'll grab, uh, you know, we'll, we'll catch a movie together. And, and then you just sit there and you don't do anything. Just watch a movie. That's not fellowshipping. That's just rolling together, man. And so... In the fellowship, sadly, within communion, the division had crept in. And apparently, was heartily approved amongst them as general practice. And so, in other words, they were okay with that division. No one, no one within the Corinth church was stepping up to the play and saying, Hey, you know what? This is wrong. This is wrong. It's, it was the opposite. It was hardly approval that says, hey, there's factions. Oh, well, that's cool. And, and, and most likely, most likely some buttering up by some with those that were probably flexing their, their, their power muscles, so to speak, their influential and authoritative muscles. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, well let's just let that go like that. Even within leadership, that happens, unfortunately, you know. Um, it's, it's just strange within the human behavior that we love to place people on pedestals and, and, and worship people. We're, we're good at that. We're good at worshiping people. And even, sadly, within the church, there's some uh, you know, worship leaders and even pastors, church leaders, that somehow within their own minds or within their own fellowships have become like rock stars. You know, they enter in and people just want to be next to them. Or, man, I met them. Or, hey, let me take a picture. Or, let me get their autograph. I mean, literally to that level. And, and it's, it's just wrong. No matter how you cut it, it's wrong. When an individual becomes the center of the attention, then guess who no longer is the center of attention? You know, God stripped away from being the center of the attention. And within the church, he is worthy of all our praise, of all our worship, of all our attention, of all our devotion. All, all, all is all, all of it. You don't split and say, well, you know, I give some to the Lord, but man, the pastor's the one who's the head and he's hard at work and he's doing this. And if it wasn't for the Lord saving him, he wouldn't be doing any of that. Right. You know? Give credit where credit is due. All blessings flow from heaven. But like I said, our sin nature, our sin nature can take the most beautiful of circumstances and turn it into a cause for division. Even with communion, you know? I, mean, I believe it's in James where it's found, and uh, you can correct me later if I'm wrong, but regarding the seating, you know, to get the best seats to those of, of high positions and let them sit in front. Like, no, man, put them in the back, you know? It's like, what, what's, this, what's this? Oh, because you make more, or because you're well known in the community, you get the best seats. And it's, and it's weird. When did the front row become the best seats in the house? Going back to the movies and the movie theaters, those are the worst seats. You don't, want to, you don't want to be in that front row in the movie theater with the big screen, your neck all cocked back, you know. Generally, those are empty. Even if it's sold out, it's like, ah, oh, I'll pass, you know. You already paid for your tickets, so what? I ain't sitting in that seat, okay. But it's weird where it's like man comes up with these weird ideas of position 
And it, and it ultimately, when you start thinking of those terms, inevitably division will creep in. And that's what was happening within the fellowship there in Corinth. Now, Paul continues and he says in verse 20, he writes, Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So in other words, they had ulterior motives. It's the, the purpose of coming together was, was supposed to be for the Lord's Supper. But because they allowed all these divisions and, and so on and so forth and, and different sects, or not sects, but um, the... Um, but basically cliques, you know, so they had different cliques within the church. So it, it, it fractured, it fractured the purpose of coming together, which was for communion. And Paul says, Paul says, that's what you're supposed to be coming for. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. And he says in verse 22, what? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? And this I will not praise you. All right, you guys got the visual here? <laughs> I mean... They were parting it up in the church. I've always often wondered, for those who say, you know, like for instance, especially, you know, the, during the holidays, a lot of our holidays, well, virtually the, the main holidays within our, uh, that we celebrate on a federal level all have to do with faith, the vast majority of them. I can't, you know, the, 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 the few that don't generally have to do with the celebration of presidents, and, and people, but for the most part, you're talking about Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, you know, or Resurrection Sunday, yeah. right? Um, all have to do with faith because of how our nation was formed. However, though, you know, and instead of that being the focus, our faith within the church and so on and so forth, worldliness has crept in. Because some of those holidays have been hijacked right by the world and by the enemy and it's become more secular. And so I often wonder if, like for instance, you know, uh, for Christmas, if I dressed up like Santa Claus and came and preached in a Santa Claus suit, how many people would be bothered by that, you know, within the church? Like, oh, pastor, what are you doing? That's blasphemous. It's like... Well, you know, well, don't we celebrate like that outside church, you know? Or if I dressed up in a bunny outfit for, for Resurrection Sunday and came taught like that, and how many, how many within the church would be horrified, you know, if I invited the Easter bunny, to, you know, <laughs> on, up, on the, up, up on the, you know, altar or whatever, how many Christians would be horrified within the church? But then they leave church and go outside and do what? The very thing that they're horrified with, you know? Or the sipping paint. I said, oh, you know what? Hey, no big deal. They have a drink here, have a drink there. Okay, cool. Next Sunday, everyone bring your favorite drink, your favorite beer, and we'll drink while, you're, while I'm teaching. Crack open the Budweiser, the Corona, whatever. Right? You wouldn't do that. And, and yet, the compromise that happens, it's like, you know, we, we behave a certain way within and then outside, it's a whole different story. Well, conversely, it's opposite. <laughs> At least according to this description, they're saving it to come to church and partying up, getting drunk within the church, and then ignoring the very needs within the fellowship. Ignoring the very needs within the fellowship. You know, the early Christians held, because basically that's what this was. This was basically like a love feast. That's what it was. Celebration of love. It was a love feast in connection with the Lord's Supper. So it's like, hey, look, we're going to have the Lord's Supper. And basically, it's the same thing that we do now, which is basically a potluck. Bring food. We'll all participate. You know, those that can't contribute, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just the, the main thing is that you come, right? And then during that time of potlucking, you know, it's the time of fellowship. And it's encouraged to what? To pray for one another. It's a time to discover 
and inquire regarding needs because within a fellowship there may be greater needs than others and those that can bless bless and those that can't you know uh, don't feel obligated to do so and so it should be like again a time for loving on one another in the early church that's what they did they're they're hosting or holding love feasts in connection with the lord's supper and like i said this was primarily a time for a health check what do I mean by health check? Well, I'm not referring to physical health. I'm referring to spiritual health. How are you, brother? How are you, sister? How's your health in the Lord? Now, if that, that uh, trickles over to the physical aspect as far as physical needs, it's like, you know what, man, I'm really struggling in this area. I lost my job. I'm trying to stay focused on the Lord, and we're coming up short you know, on finances at home, and it's it's putting an extra stress on, you know what, well, let me pray for your spiritual needs, but if you're led, then you know what, let me bless you physically as well. You know, we have, we have more than enough. Hey, church, let's get together. Let's rally around this family and lift them up and really bless them. That was the intent, and it still should be within the church. But unfortunately, the Corinth were coming, and because they had all their little cliques going on, and, and the, was, the ones that had plenty were basically rolling together. The ones that had nothing were getting the short and the stick. And it's like, well, where's the love? And they were then, in, in terms, snubbing those who had nothing. Nobody likes being snubbed. That's probably one of the most powerful weapons in marriage when you're mad at someone, right? Is the old snub. It's just like, you know, I'm just going to pretend you're not there. And I was like, oh, man. It's like, whew, that hurts. That hurts. I got snubbed. But it's not to be like that. We're to be about the needs of people. And yet, when you compare this, because, you know, remember, Paul was there for approximately 18 months. So 18 months he poured into them. Boom, boom, boom. The Lord, this is church. This is how you're supposed to love each other. He taught him the word of God and so on and so forth. 18 months, you know, Paul planted this church, poured into the Corinth community. Five years later, because that's about the approximate time that has elapsed between his planting the church and now writing the letter, it's like, what's, what's going on? And that's only five years. Think about how much correction we need as a church. And I'm talking not just our fellowship. I'm talking as a whole. It's been over 2,000 years. Correction needs to happen frequently. If it doesn't happen frequently, then you know what? It, 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 we as people, as sheep, we go amok. And as the Bible says, we go off and we do our own thing. And then, and then we too fall into that same trap and the same sin of calling you know good evil and evil good because we drift we need to maintain our our rootedness in the word of truth but like i said if you take what was going on here in the church in corinth in contrast to acts 4 Remember Acts 4? A brother named uh, Barnabas, you know, son of encouragement. And what did he do? He saw a need because there's a sudden revival that broke out. The original, they came in for the celebration of the feast. And then the word of God went forth. Thousands were saved. They didn't come prepared to remain for days. And so there's a need, a physical need. Barnabas went out, sold some property, and did what? Brought it back. To the, to the disciples, to the apostles, and put those funds at their feet and said, hey, you disperse it, do the things that you need to do in order to meet the needs of the people. And the Bible says that no one lacked. You know, There's absolutely no one that lacked during that time. But the heart, Barnabas' heart was totally what turned to the Lord and the service of the Lord and wanted to be a contributor But this is real sketch, if you ask me. I mean, I if I walked into a church and this was going on, I'd leave like right away. Like, like I'm bouncing real fast, you know? And yet, you know what? 
this goes on in some churches. <laughs> this goes on in some churches. On church property. For gain, for the purpose of financial gain, they got keggers. I mean, I, this is no joke. You know, they got keggers on church property, you know, pouring it up, selling selling alcohol to those that come and visit to the church members in order to raise funds on church property. And again, look, man, I, I, I personally don't drink because it's just not my thing anymore. You know, at one time I used to party like a rock star, do drugs, uh, drink the alcohol, go out, get wasted and all those things. But when the Lord saved me, I was done with that. I saw absolutely no benefit behind it. And so I walked away from that lifestyle. And I thank God for it. And, and yet, some will justify behavior and lifestyles and twist the Word of God and, and basically take, you know, you could take something like this. Well, you see, they're drinking. Paul didn't say not to. It's like, look, man, there's nothing good that came out of this. Nothing good whatsoever. Look at verse 23. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Which he's referring to, you know, when he was, again, the time that he spent in, in Corinth, planning the church, the 18 months. That the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink, as you drink it. In remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So there's purpose behind communion. There's clear purpose. It's not just it's not just to become some type of you know church thing that we do. And also, too, though, if you think about it in this term, communion is not is not a somber occasion. It's not a somber occasion. It really isn't. You know, it, it can be emotional. Now, for myself personally, I love communion. It, it's it's kind of um, it's kind of interesting that you know to. Distribute communion and lead communion versus being a partaker communion is totally two different experiences. It really is, in, in my humble opinion. I love being on the receiving end, just receiving communion. And I remember, you know, because at, uh, when, I, when we were going to Calvary at Downey, um, it was on the, uh, I believe it was the last Wednesday of the month. And th- that was set aside for communion. And I would be so excited about going to communion because it was just, it was just a time to be sitting at the feet of the Lord. And, and it was just something mentally different for me and, and spiritually different. That it was just like, you know, reflecting on like, man, the God of the universe died for my sins. That's, that's, how, do you, how do you wrap your brain around that? You know, a holy God. Because... You know, communion is a time of reflection. It really is. But I used to love being on the receiving end. Now, handing out communion, leading communion, it's different. Because I feel the the weight of the responsibility to make sure that why we're doing communion is communicated properly. And that, that I never lose sight of that. And that there's order in that. But communion isn't necessarily... A somber occasion, but it really is a time of celebration at the table. A time to remember, and this is important, a time to remember what we gained. What we gained through what? Through His pain 
and suffering and sacrifice. When you put it like that, it should be like any other celebration. When we celebrate birthdays, you don't sit there and go like, all right, another, you know, uh, you, you, I mean, sorry, when you, go, when you celebrate a birthday, you say, all right, another year of what? Life. You know, another year of life. You don't go to a birthday party all sombered out and go like, man, you're closer to death now. You're, 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 you know, you're coming closer to death. <laughs> no, it's a celebration of life, you know. Or other celebrations, you know, wedding celebrations, it's a time of celebration. It's a joyous occasion, you know. Uh, and the list goes on and on. Even, even at funerals, as, as, as sorrowful as people may be, it's really a reflection of what? And a time of celebration of the life and the legacy that the individual has left behind. And so, too, communion is really a time of celebration of what we have gained by his Pain, suffering, and sacrifice, his death and resurrection. That's what Jesus is saying. Remember, 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 remember. Your gain, your gain, your gain. For what? You were once dead. Once you were lost. Once you were blind, man. And now you can see. Now you're alive. Now you have hope. You have eternal uh, hope and a a place of, 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 of rest. You know, you have heaven that awaits. Now, when you get into the specifics of all this, communion is directly related to Passover. It's no coincidence, right, that communion was on the day of Passover, which was a time of, what, celebration, and a great meal was prepared, and everyone feasted on the meal. Death was about to pass him over. I don't know. That's kind of a great reason to celebrate, isn't it? It's like, like, yes, we're going to live. Woohoo! Everyone partake. The blood is on the the doorpost. The the lamb has been sacrificed. Our loved ones are gathered. The, The food smells amazing. And God has provided it all. Let's celebrate. We live. We live, you know? Like I said, it's a great reason to celebrate. But we don't only just celebrate our our current gain, but we're also, too, in essence, celebrating our future gains. And which are those? Well, rewards in heaven. Our position within the kingdom, in his government. And also, too, the greatest celebration we're going to have is seeing Jesus. Just seeing him. That's going to be the biggest celebration that we have and experience personally. You know, Jesus mentioned the whole future celebration, you know, there in in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 29. He told them, you know what, the the cup, I won't drink again until what? Until you are with me. Where? In the kingdom. In the kingdom. Man, it's like, what? What? I mean, come on, man. In communion, that's what it's all about, is remembering those things. Like, it, it's, and it's exciting. So when you hold that, that communion bread and you're holding the cup and you're thinking about, wow, soon and very soon, we'll be holding it with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. At the great feast, the one that's mentioned there in Revelation chapter 19 in verse 9. Now, it's interesting at least, you know, as I read as I read the scriptures and I and I read the stories about Jesus' earthly ministry, and you know, I read about future events that are to come and the instruction that Paul gives here to the Corinth church and just really what we experience as Christians in general, I I come to the conclusion that eating is is extremely central to the Lord's love for us. <laughs> it really is. I mean the Lord loves a good meal. He really does. And, and really, meals are representative of love because what? It's prepared for, for guests and for family members to come together and share hearts. And it's a love. It's a time of love. And it's very, it's a, it's a, a, a tangible experience, I guess you could say, regarding the heart of God, you know? 
when you think about Jesus and his earthly ministry, I think about, you know, um, well, first and foremost, the naysayers referring to the Pharisees accusing him of being a glutton, right? <laughs> which, which says what? About he ate a lot, you know? <laughs> they ate a lot. Uh, I think about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. I'm going to your pad for what? For a feast. And then, and then, in the in the miracles, uh, in the miracle of, of the uh, uh, the bread and the and the fish, I mean, it's a multiplication again. Food, feed them, feed them, feed them. And then all the people follow Jesus. Why? Because they wanted more food. They wanted to be fed. I mean, it's like that was probably like the uh, you know what Jesus was known for. It's like man. Gives great stories, but man, the food that shows up when he's around. You know, the wedding feast that he went to. And then, you know, the conversion of, of uh, the miracle of the water into the wine. And so on and so forth. So there's stories after stories after stories. And even if you go into the Old Testament, there's stories about related to food. I mean, think about the story of, of Esther. You know, we went through that book. And it was like, what? Feast after feast after feast. And then when it came to the end, when Esther was going to reveal who the evil one was and Haman, what three meals right three meals of celebration it's like esther what is it man whatever you want whatever you want that and and half the kingdom is yours man you know there's something about food that is just so critical to a happy and and prosperous and healthy spirit as well because everyone knows if you don't eat man you grow what weak but look at from a spiritual standpoint. What Jesus says, yeah, but I'm the bread that comes from heaven. And if you eat of me, you won't die. And if you drink of me, you won't thirst. And we get a, a fuller understanding of that through the natural eating. That, hey, I see the correlations. Because physically, if I don't eat properly, I feel weak, man. And I'm desirous and and how can I go out there and work for the Lord or do anything in, in a weak state? Well, spiritually speaking, if you're weakened spiritually, how can you, how can you live prosperous, in a prosperous manner if you're weak spiritually? You can't. And so you need to be strengthened in the things of God. In the meal of what? Being served up His Word. Look at verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. I want to stop there for a second because you know what? What, what exactly does this mean? It's real simple. You're on the side saying, crucify him, crucify him. It's basically all that means. Because who, who, who had the, the blood of Jesus on their hands? Well, those that yelled out, crucify him. Those that don't repent. And so if you're, if you're taking it in an unworthy manner, it's just as though you're yelling out, crucify him. In other words, his sin sacrifice wasn't good enough for you. You're not receiving him as true Messiah, as true Savior. He says in verse 28, But let a man examine himself and this is this is where most christians miss the boat so to speak because it comes just a ritual of just like okay oh it's communion oh i know what we're gonna do we're gonna we're gonna you know pastor's gonna give the message and at the end he's gonna say hey can someone hand out the elements and then we hand out the elements and we're gonna wait till you know and you kind of know the routine of things and you miss The point that no, 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 no. This is a time of self-examination or introspection. Introspection is so important. Really, where am I in my walk with you, Lord? You know? Am I the one still uh, lashing out or or thrusting out the insults? You know, crucify, crucify him? Or am I truly walking with you? Am I living my life for you? And also, too, what's within me that needs to be confessed and left at your feet, right? Because, again, if it just becomes habitual, if it just becomes a ritual thing, where's, you know, where's the power in the communion, you know? And so, 
Let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Which says what about communion? That you should take communion no matter what. You know? For he who eats and drinks... For, I'm sorry. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. You know, in in relation to what Paul had taught previously, those that were caught up in in uh, immoral lifestyles, communion is that time to repent from that lifestyle. If you don't, and you continue in that lifestyle, you could potentially be one of the ones who ends up sleeping. <laughs> Which is, you die. You know? And, and so this is an exhortation, an encouragement. This is, not a, this is not a, well, if you're in that category, you don't come. This isn't, um, you know, communion is not about, some people see it this way. It's like, well, I need to get right before I take communion. I was like, okay, well, yes and no. Because, you know, yes in the sense that it's a time of introspection, a time of self-examination. But no in the sense that if that's going to keep you from even coming to the table, then that's not what communion is all about. Communion, you're to come to the table, the celebration um, the celebration, no matter what, it's in the coming, in the right heart, that all those other things are dealt with. Not, well, I'm going to get right first and I'll take communion. That's like going to the doctor and the doctor says, well, you know what? Uh, you have a disease. I got the cure, but go get well first and I'll give it to you. Or, you know what? Hey, um, uh, I, I, need, I, need a, I need a loan to buy a house. And you go to the bank and they say, fantastic, go get rich first, then we'll lend you the money. Well, that makes no sense whatsoever. I, I'm coming because I have a need. And that's why we come to the table, because we have a need. You know, in coming to the celebration at the table, it's, it's the opposite. It's not, it's not what I bring to the table. It's what we receive at the table. At the table, we're lavished upon by the Lord Himself. We're lavished upon by the Lord Himself, man. He's got a great feast for us at the table. A meal prepared. You know, the one described in heaven is a meal prepared by His very hands that He's going to serve up Himself. And yet, why would you want to miss out on that? You know, the table is for all the... And the leopards, the the crippled, and so on and so forth. It's all about that that Second uh, Samuel nine, right? Second Samuel nine, which is the the story of Mephibosheth. Those of you familiar with it, you know that's when King, when uh, David took over the the throne and became king. He loved Jonathan. He made a promise that you know what he would take care of his family members. As basically as part of the legacy, and put out the word, "Hey, is there any family members related to Jonathan?" And they found out that you know what, there's his son Mephibosheth. He was crippled. He lived in a in another town. He says, "Go get him, bring him." Mephibosheth thought what that the king was going to kill him, and drops down on his face, like, "Oh, king, don't kill me! Kill me! I'm just but a dog, man." You know, it's like, <laughs> "Be merciful." And and David was like, "Get up." I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to destroy you. I want to what? I want to lavish on you. You have a place at the table. You have a place at the table of the king, you know? And, and when, you, when you put it in the right context as far as like, I'm at the king's table. Does anything else matter at the point? I mean, does anything else matter? Absolutely not. All the other stuff just melts away. All your, your anxious thoughts, all your burdens, all your crippledness, all the, all, all the stuff that's not of him, when you compare it to the king, just melts away. That's what happens at the table, man. That's what he lavishes on us, is his mercy, his grace, his faithfulness, 
His provision you find at the table, the table of the Lord. And the Corinth church was missing out on that. They're missing that point. Every Christian, regardless of their condition, has a place at the celebration at the table. You know, too often communion, communion is nothing more to Christians than just a tradition or a ritual. And that's a huge error. You know, for us, this may seem kind of a foreign, but because we do communion, we do it once a month. But there's some churches don't don't have communion at all. They don't do communion at all. It's just something that they teach. That, oh, yeah, they did it, but they don't practice communion. They don't partake of the feast at the table. But like I say, communion is a time of reflection, rejuvenation, thankfulness, and celebration. You know? Again, we're alive. We have eternal life. That's what the, when we hand out the elements and we remember, it's what we have gained, eternal life. Co-heirs with Christ Jesus. All the benefits that come with being uh, grafted into the family. All that. I mean, that's a big yes. That is just awesome. Lord, thank you, Jesus. And we partake. It's not like, (laughs) Jesus died. You know, he was crucified. Yes, it's true, but he, he raised, he's been raised from the dead. He's alive. And we have great gain through his pain, suffering, and sacrifice. Those are the last verses. 31 says, But if we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you may not come together for judgment And the remaining matters I shall arrange when I come. Paul strongly admonishes the Corinth church, the Corinthian church, to approach the Lord's Supper in a manner he had taught them when he was in their midst. That they would neither feel condemned by it, ignore it, nor treat it so lightly that it became nothing more than a drunken party. So there's a balance to it, right? There's a balance to it. There's, there's, again, the order that we are to practice within even having communion. There are some questions that may arise when you do a study regarding communion. And I think the first one that would probably pop in most minds is, well, how often? How often should we have communion? Well, really... As often as you want. You know, we do it once a month here. Could we do it more frequently? Sure. You know, we'd be a, an Acts 2.42 church, you know, about the word, about the gathering, and about uh, the breaking of the bread. But there is no limit. You really shouldn't be asking how often. I, I guess the more important question is, are you partaking? You know, are you partaking? The other one is, well, who partakes? Well, Christians. Only Christians. The, the feast is only for believers. Why? Well, because if you're not a Christian, how can you rejoice in your gain? You don't have that gain yet. It's just basic elementary, man. You cannot rejoice in something that you don't have. And the breaking the bread, the, the covenant that the Lord gave us through uh, um, communion is for the believer and the believer only. Now, another question some may ask is like, well, where do we partake in communion? Is it only in church? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You could partake in communion in your home, in your very home, which leads to who leads communion? Anybody who's a Christian. It reminds me of the story when I was in Haiti. I think it was the first time or the second time. I can't remember. 
I was ministering to a family, and as I was praying for uh, the mom's physical needs, I was reminded of of, uh, of this passage of scripture regarding the body and basically discerning and uh, during the time of communion. And so communion can be a, a time of healing as well, physical restoration. And so I, I told the family, I said, hey, you know what, let's, let's have communion. And we're just based in a, in a room. And so they kind of looked at me kind of like, well, you know, like here? We're like, we're not physically in the church. You know, the church is, uh, is downstairs. And I was like, you know, I said, yeah, that's fine. One of them spoke English as they were translating for me, one of the children in the family. And then they said, well, we don't, we don't have, we don't have uh, bread and we don't have wine. And so I was like, well, what do you have? Do you have anything to drink, you know? And they had, I think, like a little juice, like a, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't grape juice. It was just a juice. And they had um, some type of, um, I think it was like jello or something like that. I can't remember. But bottom line is, it's like, look, we're going we're gonna to break bread with what we have. Because the power is not in, in the elements. The power is in God. And, and in the faith that we put in God. And so once they kind of got past the, the whole part of like, okay, it's not the actual wine and it's not actually actual bread, they've rejoiced. I said, and we're going we're gonna to just rejoice in what Jesus has done for us. And so I prayed, broke up the little whatever we had, we all partook, passed it around, and we had an awesome time of communion. And it was a trip because, you know, the following year, that was one of the things that they talked about. Was that, that, that they were like so blown away that God met them right there without the actual wine and the bread. And that God would operate in that manner, you know? And so we could get too stuck sometimes on like, okay, it has to be. If you don't have, then you do with what you have. And it's all about the heart. But in your own home, go for it. You know, I would encourage you that, you know, if you're going through real tough times, you know, that you would have communion in your own house. Even if it's just a party of one. You and the Lord, that's it. Lord, I'm coming to you according to your word that you said that as often. And you know what? Right now, I'm going to, I, I got the drink, I got the bread, I'm going to have communion with you, Lord. Because that's really who we're having communion with, right? And that you commune with the Lord. And that you confess and that you just lay it at his feet. And you have that celebration just right there. Those are the things that we're supposed to be partaking in as Christians. Especially when you're talking about communion, you don't have to wait, you guys. You know? Enjoy the blessing of that celebration at the table. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to reflect on your goodness. Jesus, you gave us communion. This is the new covenant. You took the, the bread, you said, eat of it. You took the, the, the wine, you said, drink. And you, you specifically instructed us, in this way, we are to remember you. It's an opportunity for reflection and rejuvenation, introspection, Lord God, and celebration, to celebrate your goodness, to celebrate the gains that we have because of your death and resurrection. You're so good to us. And you provide all that is necessary to be prosperous and to have success, to be spiritually strong, to walk courageously, to walk boldly before our God. Go before us, Jesus, the remainder of the day and throughout the week that we would be reminded of who we are in you, Christ Jesus. We're no new creatures Done away are the ways of the old. Behold, all is new. And we thank you for the power that you've placed in us through the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for falling upon us, for placing the fire within us, Holy Spirit. We worship you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father God, for sending your only begotten Son, Jesus, that Whoever believes should be saved, should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
We thank you, Father, for adopting us as sons and daughters, for grafting us in. You call us by name. We rejoice. We celebrate all your goodness. We give all praise and honor and all glory to the name of Jesus, the name above all names. Our tongues have confessed, our knees have bowed that you are the Lord. And we do it freely, we do it willingly, we do it joyfully. Thank you, Lord God, for opening up our eyes and seeing the realities of who you are and to be able to walk with you, to commune with you all the days of our lives. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus and all God's children said, Amen.